Hi everyone, this is John. Welcome back to another episode of our weekly show, The Subcontinent. Our episodes aim to address important issues in the subcontinent which affect the governments, people, organizations and the region as a whole. We will try to explain the issues, break down controversies surrounding them and try to have some external perspectives from experts and people. In this edition of The Subcontinent, we will dive deep in the history of terror and torment against the Hazara Shia Muslim community in Pakistan and discuss how Islamabad's reaction to Daesh attacks may influence the future of Takfiri terrorism throughout Asia. Takfiri terrorists have recently leveled up their scale and frequency of attacks in the western edge of the subcontinent. Active mainly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, these Daesh followers, or the so-called Khurasan ISIS, have a long history of targeting Shia Muslims in the region, particularly the Hazaras. The latest bout of terror attacks against Hazara Shias has put Pakistan in the spotlight again over its lack of capabilities or resolve to protect its minority communities against the extremists. This year started with yet another horrid tragedy for Pakistan's Hazara Shias, a Muslim minority in a country made for Muslims. The deadly attack occurred in the early days of January when terrorists slaughtered a group of Hazara people who were working as miners in Mach, an area 17 kilometers east of Quetta, the capital of Pakistan's southwestern Baluchistan province. The gunmen abducted the coal miners and took them to nearby mountains. Then they blindfolded them, tied their hands behind their backs and opened fire at them from close range. Most of the victims' throats were also cut. Daesh Takfiris or ISIL later claimed responsibility for the attack through its communication channels. <laughs> Pakistan <laughs> Haji Jawad, a local Hazara leader, described the act of terror as an attempt to sabotage peace in the province and to provoke sectarian strife, urging the government to bring the perpetrators to justice immediately. As news of the killing spread through the community, Hazaras took to the streets in protest, blocking a highway near Quetta. The bodies were placed on the road as protesters called for the government and security forces to follow through on promises to ensure their safety. The horrendous and absolutely brutal terrorist attack was condemned by an overwhelming number of people and groups, both from inside and outside of Pakistan. But the Hazara people, who felt fed up with the inaction vis-a-vis -vis such atrocities, wanted something more tangible than mere denunciations. They held several days of protests and did not bury the victims until the Pakistani Prime Minister accepted to go to Quetta and promised better protection for them. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan was quick to tweet about the assault, condemning the killing of the coal miners as another cowardly, inhuman act of terrorism. But when Hazara started rallies and asked for a visit by the Prime Minister to hear their demands for justice and security, he called their request blackmail. Unki ek ye demand hai ki ji Prime Minister aaye to phir ham logon lashon ko dafnaenge. Maine unko message pucha ye hai ki dekhe, jab sab demands bhi aapki maan liye hain. So this demand that we are not going to do it the Prime Minister comes to the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister does not do blackmail in any country. This set off further furor throughout the country. 
हम आपको कोई ब्लैक मिली कर रहे हैं आप आए हमारे शराय सुने हमें इंसाफ दें हमारे कातिलों को भी कैफे किरदार तक पहुँचाएँ हम आपसे वादा करते हैं आप हम आप हमसे सबसे पहले वादा करें कि ऐसा कोई वाक़ नहीं होगा आप हमें बल्कि नोटिस लिख के दे दें कि कोई ऐसा काम नहीं होगा हज़ारा कम्यूनिटी का एक भी शख्स आज के बाद इस तरह दर्दनाक मौत नहीं दिया जाएगा उनको फिर हम भी इस धरने से खामोशी से उठ जाएंगे मैं इमरान साहब इमरान खान साहब से ये कहूँगा प्लीज आ जाए इन लोगों की तकलीफ को थोड़ा सा समझ लें और कुछ नहीं Finally after about a week of demonstrations in major cities across Pakistan Khan promised to visit the grieving community and assure their protection Retrospectively it seems paradoxical that the premier was so unwilling for the visit Before coming to power in 2018 Khan was known as a vocal decrier of Pakistan's leaders for not doing more to stop attacks on the Hazara community and for not rushing to Quetta to offer condolences after similar assaults. Authorities vowed the arrest of the attackers, payment of compensation to the bereaved families and better security for the Hazara. They also announced plans to set up a high-level commission headed by Baluchistan's Home Minister to investigate attacks against the Hazara community in the past 22 years. Demand was saying that every time there is a government that is sent to the government, whatever the government is sent to the government. The rest of them is not believed that if you have demands, what is your name, 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 what is your name. But it is that it is only for two or three days. It was their idea that this will be finished properly. The name Hazara is said to be derived from a phrase which used to mean happy and sublime heart. After decades and even centuries of agonizing alienation, these Persian speaking Shia Muslims still have sublime hearts, but they are not happy. They mostly live in two fortified enclaves in Quetta, home to more than 600,000 Hazaras, whose Central Asian features make them an easy target for takfiri attackers who consider them heretics. Having a history of persecution by fanatics, Hazaras are of the view that they are living as prisoners in Quetta. These hard-working and talented people who have excelled in society when given any chance are living in a precarious situation. They hardly can exercise their fundamental rights as human beings. They can't move freely and have to restrict their daily activities to specific areas because almost nowhere is safe for them. The prevailing situation of fear due to back-to-back -back bombings, shootings and suicide attacks has displaced many of these frustrated people across the country and forced many others abroad. In the past several decades, thousands of Hazaras have been killed by takfiri ideologues in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the likes of Lashkar-e-Jang V or Daesh Khorasan. हज़ारा कम्यूटिंग का ये पहली बार नहीं है ऐसे से पहले भी कई ऐसे वाकियात हुए हैं कि वो हद से ज़्यादा जुल्म बर्बरी है कुमार को चाहिए कि ये अपनी तरफ से जिस तरह वज़ीरिस्तान में अप्रेशन हुआ ऐसा अप्रेशन बल रिस्तान में भी होना चाहिए कि इनको भी कोई सबक हासिल हो दोबारा ना वो सिर्फ शियों को तारगट नहीं करते बहुत सी सिक्योरिटी वाले आर्मी वाले मनीषी वाले वो बेचारे भी इस लपेट में आते हैं ये हकूमत को अच्छी तरह Following each carnage, authorities have repeated their hollow promises. Hazaras have heard it all. They want concrete plans for reform and rehabilitation. The geopolitical upheaval that followed the US invasion to the region proved to be the death knell for many people. The US so-called war on terror made extremists and terrorists in Afghanistan and Pakistan joined hands with the US but simultaneously supported the Taliban also. Hazaras were among the most vulnerable people in the face of the fury attacks. Countrywide Saudi sponsored madrasas to teach Wahhabism on the backdrop of Islamabad's decade-old policy of appeasement towards anti-Shia militancy seemed as other factors of the takfiri crimes. The Daesh attack on miners wasn't just about aggravating the grief and fear of Hazaras. 
Takfiri sees such bloodshed as useful propaganda weapons to cultivate wealthy and powerful benefactors. Daesh presence in Pakistan started with a series of graffiti by supporters of the group but spread fast as the group forged alliances with like-minded extremists and enjoyed the support of a nationwide network of Saudi-backed madrasas. Thanks to madrasas, the Daesh in Pakistan is even more successful in recruitments than Afghanistan. The fact that Washington is in open and direct talks with Taliban after decades of war is a proof for Daesh that if it manages to establish a stronghold in the region, the United States will ultimately have to sit on the negotiation table with them. This may intensify the rivalry between Daesh and Taliban both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Pakistan plays a critical role in the Taliban-US negotiations, and since the power and reach of takfiris in Pakistan are directly dependent on the status of the group in Afghanistan, Islamabad's response to extremist attacks will be crucial for the future of takfiri terrorism across the subcontinent and South Asia. Okay, we are now joined by Dr. Liaqat Ali Khan, who is an emeritus professor at Washburn University School of Law. Uh, Mr. Khan, welcome to our show. So, why is Daesh Takfiri group uh, increasing its activities in Pakistan? Well, I think Daesh, uh, first, first we need to know what Daesh is. I think it's predominantly an Arab group that is trying to uh, force Islam and a certain version of Islam on the Muslim countries. I mean, of course, they are fighting the West, but I think that is probably not their main goal. I think their main goal is to go to different Muslim countries, whether it is Syria or Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq. And first of all, take hold of the territory so that they can operate freely from there. And second, they have very distinct ideas uh, regarding what they need to do. I think they are trying to reimpose uh, the rule of the Arabs over the Arabs and over the Arabs and non-Arab populations, because they think that Islam has drifted away from its motherland and from its original people and therefore they are resurrecting the islam that they think uh, should be the islam of everyone and they totally feel that whether it's syria or iraq or iran or any other muslim country they have left the true message of islam and therefore, they need to reimpose, even by force, uh, on the populations uh, living in uh, Arab and non Arab countries. So I think uh, they feel that Pakistan, because of its uh, you know, size and also because it has nuclear weapons, uh, it needs to come under the influence of ISIS. And I think uh, they have found a way to, you know, uh, to, to pursue that mission. So they are in Afghanistan, which is totally in chaos. And I think they're gonna operate from Afghanistan until they have a strong foothold there, which they already do. And then uh, attack the people they don't like and harass the governments so that uh, they become frustrated and confused and then they enter the territory. So in other words, I think ISIS is looking for a global domination of their versions of Islam. I think they mistakenly believe that they can resurrect the seventh century where the you know, first Muslims uh, expanded their rule over almost uh, half the world at that time. So I think they have those dreams and they feel that uh, Pakistan is an essential, um, you know, milestone 
or in essential geography in order to uh, control uh, the Muslim world. All right, so you're saying that they want to make territorial gains, uh, reimpose their own version of Islam, and Pakistan is particularly important because of nuclear weapons and geostrategic importance. So, what are the roles of Saudi Arabia's madrasas in recruiting and training terrorist activities and takfiris in Pakistan? I can say in very broad terms that the philosophy of ISIS is not very different from the uh, teachings of Abdul Wahab, uh, who is, uh, uh, you know, followed in Saudi Arabia. And I think, again, the mission is to go back to the first 50 years of Islam, which was, you know, predominantly Arab. I think there was Salman Farsi over there, but there were very few non-Arabs who were the pioneers of Islam. And uh, for some reason, I think Saudi Arabia and ISIS, they feel that they have to go back to the first 50 years and, uh, re and, and resurrect that sensibility, that mission of Islam, and uh, go to different countries with Arabs as the center of the movement. And I'm not sure if that can be done now. I think Islam has, you know, moved away actually for miles and and uh, intellectually and otherwise from the, you know, original 50 years, even though the Quran and the Prophet, I mean, they're still authentic and they are still part of Islam and this central part of Islam. But I'm not sure if the first 50 years can be resurrected uh, in its entirety. All right, Mr. Khan, uh, let's just go and take a quick look at how global media has covered this issue and then we can continue. Pakistan is home to 220 million people, almost all of whom are Muslim. It is also home to one of the largest Shia populations in the world, as an estimated 20% of Muslims there are Shia. At Wadiya Hussein graveyard, red flags are planted by the graves of observant Shia Muslims who have died in targeted killings, guns or bomb attacks. Since 2001, more than 2,600 Shia Muslims have been killed in violent attacks in the South Asian country, according to the South Asia Terrorism Portal Research Organization. This year has seen an uptick in targeted killings against Shias. The persecution of the Hazara community dates all the way back to the 16th century and the reign of the Mughal Emperor Barbara in the region. And the cause behind this targeting of the community, which by the late 19th century had become full-blown ethnic cleansing, is underscored by Emperor Barbara in his memoirs Babur Nama. The Mughals targeted Hazaras for their 12 Shia religious identity and Mongol heritage. Half a millennium later, it is the same ethno-religious combination that is being used to fan genocide of the Hazaras. For 22 years, our demands are the same, that our killers are arrested, that their facilitators are arrested, and those who lead them be arrested. It is not so difficult to understand this. If the rulers do not understand this, then I do not know what their compulsions are that they cannot act against those who lead these terrorists, nor can they act against the attackers themselves, said Said Muhammad Raza, a local leader of the Shia Muslim Majlis Wahdat Muslimin, MWM political party. All right, Mr. Khan, welcome back to our show. Uh, so, please tell us how the situation for Hazara Shia Muslims is in Pakistan. Uh, why does no one protect them? Well, I think if you if you look at Hazaras, it is a population which has, uh, you know, sort of Mongolian ethnicity. I think they are called the children of Genghis Khan. And, uh, but that was, you know, seven centuries ago. So it seems like over the seven centuries, the Hazaras, a distinct uh, ethnic group, uh, and they're scattered in the region. I think there are 500,000 in Iran. There are probably more than 500,000 in, in Pakistan. 
and there are quite a few in in central Afghanistan. And I was, you know, researching that there are some also in Australia, 200,000 of them, some in Europe, very few in America. So it seems like the Hazaras, they are uh, a population that is ethnically different from wherever they are. I think they are different from Pashtuns, they are different from Iranians, and they are different from the Punjabis and the Sindhis uh, and the Balochis uh, in uh, in uh, in Pakistan. Even though in Pakistan they are in Balochistan, but nevertheless their ethnic uh, uh, separation is still there, just like it is there in Afghanistan and even in Iran and obviously in, in Australia. So that is first reason that a lot of Pakistanis and even Pashtuns feel that the Hazaras are not from the region, that they're aliens, that they are foreigners. And uh, that is first reason that, you know, nobody owns them. And that's very unfortunate that after having lived uh, for 700 years in these you know countries they still feel that uh, they are foreigners and the people feel that they are foreigners too so it's it's a it's a disconnect between their presence and their belonging to pakistan and afghanistan so i think just like foreigners are mistreated everywhere i think hazaras are mistreated in Afghanistan as well as in Pakistan. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Khan, for being with us on our show. It was really nice having you here. Uh, viewers, we have with us Mr. Zafar Mehdi, and uh, let's talk to him and see what's been going on on social media. Salam, John Hussain, this is Said Zafar Mehdi, and today we will discuss social media buzz past few weeks over the carnage in Pakistan where 10 Hazara Shias were brutally killed by Daesh Takfiri terrorist group. This is not the first time and perhaps won't be the last so naturally there is anger, there is outrage and there is frustration. Let's take a look at some of the reactions on social media over this incident. Author and lecturer Mohammed Shujai points to safety and security concerns of this vulnerable ethnic minority. He terms the lack of action in preventing violence against Hazara Shias a betrayal. Twitter user Mohammed Ahsanullah says it's not important to be a Shia to understand the pain and plight of this community. He urges the Pakistani government to take action. In another tweet, user Faika says the anger within the community is justified because state has failed to provide them protection. She refers to an incident eight years ago when over a hundred Hazara Shias were killed in the same place, which shows nothing has changed for them all these years. Political commentator Michael Kugelman responding to Pakistani journalist Muid Pirzada says this incident points, points to the emergence of Daesh in Pakistan. He says the militant group first made inroads in the country back in 2015 in the form of Daesh Khorasan. Professor Adnan Rasool says it's time to pause and think why the Hazara community has to deal with this kind of relentless persecution. And he has an important question, why the Pakistani government has been unable to address this issue. Like many social media users, lawyer Benazir Jatoy criticizes the government of Imran Khan for poor handling of this issue and his reluctance in reaching out to the families of victims. She terms it the lowest point for the government. User Zahra says the plight of Hazara Shias has no takers, not even the so-called champions of human rights. She says Daesh is basically the creation of US and she cites an assassination of top anti-Daesh commander General Qasim Soleimani as an example of US complicity in Daesh crimes. Thanks for being with us. It's back to you, John Hussain, in the studio. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was our episode about the history of terror against the Hazara Shia Muslim community in Pakistan. To watch bits of our episodes and for more updates, follow us on our social media platforms and make sure to give us feedback about what you think. We'll meet the same time, same day next week. Thanks for watching.